So welcome to another episode of Jorge Cast. And today I have here beside me a great friend to talk about digital twins. Dan is the guy to talk about that. <laughs> Dan, can you introduce yourself for who never heard about you? Yeah, certainly. Um, and again, thank you, Jorge, for taking the time out to do this. This is really, really an honor. It's great. Um, so my name is Dan Isaacs, and I am the CTO and general manager of the Digital Twin Consortium. Now, for those of you that haven't heard about that, we have a website, digitaltwinconsortium.org, and we were formed about three years ago. And our founders were Microsoft and Dell, ANSYS, physics-based modeling and simulation company, and then also Lendlease. And the interesting aspect about Lendlease is the CEO for digital transformation at Lendlease was the CEO for GE Digital. So he got to see all the values, all the benefits, the productivity improvements, efficiencies that were recognized using a digital twin as it grew up in its specific area and helped to drive some of those within manufacturing, within aviation, within energy, within medical. So you can see there's a whole slew of different industries where digital twins can provide significant value. And what we really look at is those areas where it's really transformative in terms of the outcomes that are recognized by using a digital twin as opposed to those areas where you don't have a digital twin. Great. We, we, we saw a lot of stuff and a lot of texts, videos and tons of uh, uh, platforms doing digital twins, doing solutions, miracle solutions and simulations and every other things that can brings all to your to your project but what is I, I guess that's the question what is a digital twin yeah that's a great question a lot of people i've seen say oh this is a technology we're using we're going to go and we're going to do twinning of this object mm -hmm. it, it really comes down to the enabling technologies that allow the digital twin to be able to be as, I would say, flexible, adaptable, configurable, composable, is really more of a methodology. It's an approach. It's really a journey. And, and one of the things we, we hear is, well, you know, how do I even start? Mm -hmm. and, and one of the, the things that this was actually a approach that was based on a conversation with the co-chair of our natural resources working group that he had with his end customer. And his end customer basically has several different uh, areas around the world. And one of their groups, multidisciplinary, one of the groups was working on artificial intelligence. Another group was looking at it from doing the, the analytics side of that and the business intelligence coming from that. Another group was looking at the platform stack. How does this align when I have this convergence of the IT and OT? Um, and it really became down to a point where need to understand a way to unify that understanding and that approach within the organization. And what the uh, concept that came out was, um, they incubated this concept again within Natural Resources Working Group to look at it not in terms of the technology or the architecture, but look at it more in terms of the capabilities. Mm -hmm. And taking a page out of the book, Jobs to be Done, what job are you hiring the digital twin for? And from that respect, understand what are the capabilities that are necessary to achieve that job or achieve that objective, accomplish that objective. And so the way that uh, this was brought out was to look at it in terms of a very familiar format, and that's a periodic table. So replace the elements of the periodic table with the capabilities and group them in the specific areas such as visualization or security and trustworthiness or management, integration, um, how do you manage that data? So you have these categories and these groupings, and then you're able to look at that and understand from, I think there was a total of 62 capabilities within this periodic table that were shown, then be able to look at that and say, okay, now I see the capabilities to accomplish that job. Now I can look and see what is the optimal technology so the difference between a technology... First the problem, first the, the, the need for a solution and then find the correct technology to apply on it. Exactly, right? exactly. I may not need to go and train a neural network. It may be a simple algorithm yeah. would be enough. 
or maybe a simple dashboard with different thresholds mm -hmm. that would be set will be enough. So you really use that from the understanding what is the job, understand the capabilities, then look at the optimal technology, then look at the data you have available. Are the sensors there that I need? Are they correct? Is that going to give me the right information? Or do I need to supplement that with synthetic data? Mm -hmm. And that will ensure I have another degree of accuracy and precision based on if I have gaps in my data. Then you can look at that from an implementation standpoint, what is the optimal architecture? When we talk about, when we talk about the digital twins, I believe the, there is a similar problem as we had in IoT in the past because the people becomes to simplify that so much or mm -hmm. to complex this so much. Yeah and said, no, you have to do all these capabilities, all these things, and right. it is not about that. And Correct. I, I don't know, but I believe that Digital Twin is not for every problem, is not for every company. Do you, do you, can you tell me a little bit about that? It's for everyone, every, every single solution should have a Digital Twin, mm. uh, or no, it's more for a complex situation, and what is behind this mm -hmm. for the people knows what is they have challenging them? Yeah, I, I think it really comes down to, again, what is the application you're looking at? And, and one, of the, one of the recommendations we say in terms of starting your journey on the, of this digital twin, being able to do this, is to really look at it in terms of what is the low hanging fruit? Mm -hmm. What is that main objective that you want to achieve? Distill it down to what is really the area I want to focus on right now that I know I can have a quick win. And I'll give you an example of that uh, coming up here, but what I want to really highlight is, and this gets back to your question, does every single thing need a, or a problem need a digital twin? It again depends on the application, depends on what you're looking for, but what I will say is there are significant values in using a digital twin. And so one of the first things we did within the consortium was to get everybody speaking the same language. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of hype out there about digital twins. So if you think about it in terms of what are the foundational elements of a digital twin, you can look at it in terms of, number one, a virtualization of a physical entity and or a process. Think about supply chain management, think about operational resiliency, these types of things. But then also the key factor is having a synchronization mechanism to allow the data from the physical entity or process to be able to update within our, or update that virtualization. Because that synchronization mechanism now allows you at a given frequency, often known as a twinning rate, to have the requisite level of fidelity, the precision and accuracy of what's happening at that quote unquote real time mm -hmm. on the physical entity, at the physical entity or the process and be able to synchronize that with your virtualization. So now you have an accurate representation of that. And then based on that, the actionable insight that's gained from that synchronized data that's coming back can then be used to conditionally operate on the physical entity or process. And if you think about that, what that gives you is a complete closed loop. And that closed loop, that part is really the crystal yeah. ball. That's the part that gives you, okay, if I have all this data and I know all these other situations and scenarios, I can vary some of these different um, uh, inputs and I can then see what is the effect on my physical entity. I can, I can see that in terms of modeling, in terms of simulation. So what the digital twin is really doing is giving you a holistic view. Um, we had the chief, digital, the chief digital officer for digital transformation at NASA at our last member meeting in Reston, Virginia, and what she said was, we use the historical information. That gives us the hindsight. Then we use what's happening now, the situational awareness event intelligence. That's the current, mm -hmm. so that's the insight. To then be able to take that, and with the highest level of confidence, because this is a holistic view, to now be able to predict, simulate, and forecast the future. That's the foresight. It's like a maturation levels, right? Absolutely. So you begin on the telemetry and historical data, then you start doing some actions uh, at thresholds or implementing some mm -hmm. artificial intelligence on it or on the, on the field, and then you go to the next level. 
as we there we are talking real about the cyber physical systems working together and talking with the other side that's virtual mm -hmm. one and and doing the, a great job I, I guess the thing that digital twin is excellent at doing is bringing together disparate sources mm -hmm. of data and being able to then run have multiple types of analytics variations of this to then be able to choose and identify that optimal outcome and that may be preventing unplanned downtime yeah that might be avoiding a catastrophic failure or looking at optimizing or energy uh, efficiency improvements uh, so there's a whole variety of those areas that can scale in those different aspects um, one example i can give you is one company hired one of our members to do just pure condition monitoring I just want to know what's failing. That's mm -hmm. it. I just want to understand that because um, this customer owns a mine or owns mines. And the productivity, the output of that mine was not matching what some of the others were. And I was saying, why did this happen? What's going on? That's all I want to know. Say, so, okay, so they instrumented it out. I think it was a matter of three weeks they were able to identify, okay, we know where the problems are. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Excellent. I said, but don't you want to know? If we can tell you how, you can identify before it happens and predict where that next unplanned downtime is going to occur, where your next failure is going to occur. So before it happens, you can already plan for it. Now you have the parts, you understand what's going on, you have the sequence, you know what you need to do, and you will avoid that unplanned downtime. You'll be able to do that in a regular scheduled approach. You can have your staff ready to roll the trucks. You can have the parts you need, all the rest of that. Wouldn't that be of value? And they said, sure, but, but prove that. And they did. It was over a period, I think it was six months, they identified 44,000 tons of ore that was not being brought to the surface because of all these unplanned downtimes. This is a mine a couple miles yeah. under, or half a mile underground, but it's got 50 miles of conveyor belt connected. So they were able to identify that and then optimize that so that guess what that failure that was happening we know why we can actually help yeah. go to the manufacturer yeah. so now the other aspect you get with a digital twin is the continuous improvement yeah. and you can see these things and so now where it was saving roughly millions of dollars now it's saving tens of millions yeah. of dollars and it says well what about the borers the crushers the transport multi-million dollar transport from uh, ground to surface uh, or for underground to surface Look at that. What about the fact of how I use the data within my organization? Because guess what? I own six other mines. And I own the fertilizer plant that uses that ore. And I own the distribution centers that send it to the different locations, the fertilizer off to the different uh, um, locations. So it's an entire value chain. So those single digits of millions turned into tens even hundreds of millions. It's over very, that. it's very different than just telemetric data and oh, AI running to detect inside. It's not. It's more uh, when we talk uh, with our clients, we talk about a model. We talk about aggregate data that you consume inside one endpoint, one mm -hmm. exactly that. It's not about oh, I have to correlate some good stuff. I have all the data. I have all all the historic data, but. I will, I will have the, this job to do. Exactly. And when we have a digital twin, it's really, really different. You, you take uh, a good example of real world, mm -hmm. right? So where, where digital twin is today? Where, where, what you were seeing? I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll answer that question by an example. And another example I talked about earlier about transformative outcomes. So we had within our healthcare and life science working group we have 12 different domains actually including our horizontal that we have within the consortium where we started out with aerospace and defense manufacturing uh, infrastructure scaling from smart buildings to smart cities um, natural resources which included oil and mine oil and gas but also mining and renewables and so values in digital twins across every single phase of the life cycle there's value in the planning there's value in the simulation, the modeling. Mm -hmm. There's value in the deployment. There's value in the maintenance of that. There's value in the operations, excuse me, the operations and the maintenance, even the decommissioning, there's value. So, yeah. so what we've done is we've actually created 
um, based on our members, and we're very highly member driven within this consortium, highly collaborative, is we've created a reference library. And the reference library, to your point, is real world use cases and case studies that demonstrate that value through these real world applications at those different phases of the life cycle. Only members can have access to that or it's a public access? Great question. On to our website again. DigitalTwinConsortium.org, under the Initiatives tab, you will see Technology Showcase. So we brought all these use cases, this entire reference library, and we've made that public in terms of being able to understand what the objective of that digital twin in that application is, what the value it provides, and then look at it in terms of how we structured that in the framework, and then moving that forward into the different lenses that we looked at, because you can't retrofit security in these cases. You really have to start with that. In fact, we have a white paper coming out that's foundational that talks about that full platform stack. Mm -hmm. When I converge IT and OT, what does that full stack look like? So that's an introductory level. That's going to be published in the next couple of weeks. And we have several others uh, following that. It's much more than technology as the people are talking oh, about absolutely. when they talk about our absolutely. digital twins and IoT also because it's only protocols and, and when we go to, to, to talk about that, is that, what protocols are will we use, how, how database I will store the data, how a bunch of APIs and how do I put security on APIs, it's not more about that. Uh, of course it's important at the development of the solution, mm -hmm. but I guess it's the small part of it. So the example that I'll give to uh, illustrate back to your question is we had, uh, we had one of our members actually talking in our healthcare and life science working group. And he says, okay, I used to have very, very bad epileptic seizures, grand mm -hmm. mal. I mean, I could not function. It was terrible. And I went to a doctor, went to a research center, went to some of the universities. And what I now have is they took a virtual, a digital twin of my brain. So they scanned that, they mapped that out, and they identified areas where they could implant electrodes. So they implanted electrodes, and they started out with very low voltage, and I had a seizure. They increased the voltage very gradually. The intensity of that seizure diminished. I then had another grand mal. They increased it again. I haven't had a grand mal for years. I just got my latest update. They updated my operating system. It's all BLE connected. I have my virtual, virtualization of my brain. I have my physical, me. And I have that synchronization of data to conditionally bring the optimal outcome. It's a perfect example. And if that's not transformative in nature, I don't know what is. It's not sci-fi anymore. It we is are living not sci-fi. We are we are living, and, and this. I saw I saw something about that in in last CAS mm -hmm. in Vegas. Mm -hmm. the, I was in a in a presentation that the people are talking about that about the, some diseases that we can do a, a digital twin of the, the human. It's amazing. And man, it's it's really really incredible. From the the term coined in 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 eighties, right? Mm -hmm. From from NASA. What do you see is 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 different today. All right, of course I'll, we I'll have... correct you on that one thing, and and um, and I can do this because the father of the concept of digital twin, Dr. Michael Greaves, who wrote the pivotal paper on product lifecycle manufacturing, and that was all about really a mirroring of what we have in the physical. And he said, "Well, wait a minute, no." So with his colleague, John Vickers, who is now the CTO for additive manufacturing at NASA said, no, the term's digital twin. He said, I like that, I'll coin that. So he'll be the first to tell you, I didn't come up with the term digital twin, but I sure as hell made that concept where it was. And through all the papers, it's brilliant. I actually had the honor at the uh, IoT Solution World Congress in Barcelona uh -huh. to present him a Lifetime Achievement Award. Yeah, when they, when they, when they start talking about that, it was only for the, the air special industry, right? Mm -hmm. And now we are, we are seeing it's using we we have several several cases uh one of them in in smart buildings mm -hmm. and man it's it's amazing we have all the the plant and in hands but we we know what's going on if we have a, a water leak or, or something mm -hmm. like this a behavior of a user inside the the floor 
oh, he's not going to the room, he's going to the other one, so I will start the air conditioning venting on that, and then the, this, is a, this is a pretty good stuff. But the, uh, I believe that now we have more technologies to grow fast the digital twin, to mm -hmm. create a digital twin faster than in the past. Because in the past, it's more about simulation and telemetric, about the data and inside a mathematical module. So today we have tons of technology. How do you see this in the forecast for that? I think it's a great question. And um, yeah, to your point where it really started. And I mean, digital twins have been around a very long time. Mm -hmm. It's just now we've had the confluence of all these technologies where we can start to see this and again, through uh, the, uh, the brilliance of, and knowledge of, of the, these leaders in the industry and Dr. Michael Greaves bringing out these pivotal papers and really helping to sort of bring, uh, wrap your arms around what this digital twin is and what this evolution looks like. And that's really what we're seeing is we're seeing, to your point, we're seeing continue to evolve. And you know, we started out our consortium, as I said, three years ago, we had 50 members. We're now closing on over 200 members. And we have end users, we have four airports. And through our members, links to other, uh, other areas. One of our members, Orange County Public Works, they run 800 plus buildings, all the waterways, all the dams, mm -hmm. the ports, the bridges, the roads, the rails, and John Wayne International Airport. That's under their responsibility. And what they're doing is incredible. And so we see this, we've had uh, other other end users, I mean, I, I, we could go on for, <laughs> for quite a while here, but again, I encourage you to take a look at our digitaltwinconsortium.org, but to get back to your point, um, is looking at that evolution. And one of, our, uh, one of our members is looking from a standpoint of that AR, the VR, the visualization, and understand what is that implication. And what they actually do is pretty brilliant. They're using a digital twin of one of the largest hospitals in Singapore to be able to analyze and look at the viral dispersion in the loading in that area. And now what they're doing is they're applying not just augmented reality, mm -hmm. they have virtual reality, they actually were demonstrating this, um, and they were able to show essentially how they can bring through a, a graph database, and they show this as a, as a connected structure. Think about a globe. And all the globe is made up of these tiny little squares. Each one of these squares represents a patient in that hospital. Oh. I think there's either 3,000 or looking at 6,000 beds in that hospital. So you have the whole hospital virtualized, then just blow away the walls. Then you see the beds and you see the wards. And be, by being able to look, again, that hindsight, insight, and foresight, by being able to see that information, and it's all in real time. Every one of these patients has an Apple. They have an iPad, excuse me. And when they're checked in, that's theirs. They have that data and that's all linked in. So now all that information is quote unquote in real time captured. So now I can visualize that every one of the patient's data, obviously um, our member got an NDA to be able to get access to this, but they saw the value of this. So now they can look at that and they can see if there is a elevated temperature or there's also a Vox in, in there for detection. They see a very heavy viral load. They can immediately say, okay, there's something going on, quarantine, but now let's trace back. Let's take that slider in time and look back. Who visited? Which doctor? Which nursing staff? What are the other patients that came in? How did we shift around and move that? Now he can actually help to identify where that potential contagion is and who they've come into contact with. So we're talking about looking at a way to be able to contain at a very early uh, stage in time a viral outbreak. So that's going on right now. And that's one of our use cases. Again, you can go onto our website, you can see Whoa. that. Um, and then on top of that now, he's applying very specific analytics. So to get back to your question of where is it, where are we going with this? We've already seen the rise of artificial intelligence. We've seen the rise of now having the, uh, the GPT, GPT side of things. World, yeah. So there are ways to leverage that GPT to continue to evolve and bring a level and a degree of understanding and awareness of that information in a way that we hadn't before. Training with this this data and doing generative information too. 
to continue that. It and will be an amazing time. Absolutely, and on top of that, back to your point, is what we see is we see more automation mm -hmm. where these become more autonomous in nature. So it's really about data-driven decisions, but now we're getting to the next phase of that. We're in very early stages, but now we're getting to the next phase, which is the data management of those decisions. And how much is the human in the loop versus the digital twin talking to the other digital twin, talking to the entire system of systems or mm -hmm. subsystems in this case of digital twins throughout and being able to make those decisions independently of the human. Now we have one member who handles, I think it's 24 million messages for supply chain a day. And those messages have anywhere, I think it's from six to 12 different data points. You can't manage that with Excel spreadsheets no, and no, understanding, no. look at the correlation. Not only, not only talking about Excel spreadsheets, if you, if you put it on, the, on a time series database, the, exactly. the, the, Even the consuming of that, the costs will be very high. So exactly. we, you, you should do this in an aggregate model to consume that in the time. To, because when we talk about a manager of a factory or something like or, or a, 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 a place any, anywhere, Mm -hmm. We are talking about what I can do now. They do not think about, ah, I don't want to see a dashboard. I don't want to see data. I want to see telemetry. And many I want times to, the dashboard yeah. is very confusing yeah. because there's all this data. It's a case where there's actually less What I want more. to know is what I have to do now. Yeah. And what is, what is coming next? What is the decision? Yeah. What is the action? And yeah. so the way they manage this is all the things that are standard procedure are taken care of autonomously. It mm -hmm. already handles it, done. Prioritization, all done, done. It's the exceptions that they jump into and that's where they have to get to. Yeah. And that's the anomalies and understanding that anomalies. Yeah. And is that an anomaly that's gonna impact me? I have to change prioritizations? Because in this case, this is um, uh, for hospitals. These are the oxygen canisters and other types of mm -hmm. gases. You when can you talk about the supply priority, chain and, and take this. It's the, and entire, the entire process. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and when that doesn't, when that breaks down, you know, there's lives yeah. that are in jeopardy. So, you know, it's, it's again, it's look at that throughout the entire value chain. And now as we evolve, it's the automation or the independence of those types of decisions being done because we can't do it fast yeah. enough. And there's many different scenarios like that. So I think this all comes full circle. We have Is too many challenges to, to, to archive this because we are talking here about more security, uh, data 100%. reliable. Uh, uh, we are talking about identity on the devices at the field because if the device on the field was a fake one or mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they will create a problem in the cloud, in the data, in this all the structure of that. Right? Exactly, and, and to that point, within the consortium what we've done is we've identified sort of those core common characteristics. Data is the lifeblood of a digital yeah. twin. I have to be able to access that data somewhere. As soon as I do that, I open up threat thresholds. So now I have to look and understand, is there a man in the middle attack going on? Mm -hmm. Is there a denial of service where I can't get the data I need? Is there some other thing? And I need to store that data. Yeah. So those are sort of the common characteristics. But the enabling technologies are really what is fundamental and driving the evolution of that digital twin, as we've seen with going from the IoT side of that, then moving into the analytics and the visualization, the AR, the VR, then the high performance compute, the massive compute power that I can now handle. Now with the artificial intelligence, whether it's the machine learning or through the evolution of that, these um, um, LLMs and, mm -hmm. and using GPT, all the rest of this, now we start to see this as it gets more and more independent. We're just at the very, very initial stages of this. Yes. But what you've we seen We are just is that in evolution. the beginning. Yeah, we are just in the beginning and talking about only one player. And uh, <laughs> in the near future, we will have several players doing this and... It's pretty amazing where this yeah. is going. And yeah. so within the consortium, as I said, we've been growing incredibly. We now have uh, 30 countries represented. Yeah. And then we link into universities around the world and we link into other organizations through our liaison program that have hundreds of companies as part of that. And the interesting thing, there's 24 different liaisons across many, many different uh, verticals or domains they're all driven by our members. 
We didn't yeah. go out and seek those. Our members are working with these guys saying, hey, this is really good. There's opportunities to collaborate. So yeah. we reach out, we work together. They are on the field, so they, they knew what they, they knew what's going on oh, yeah. and what's the Absolutely. challenge, the pitfalls. The, the problem is on, on involved on that. And that's why I say our reference library is based on these real world use cases where they are in the field. Yeah. Whether it's remote operated uh, control center for massive wind farms mm -hmm. or whether it's digital twin of a hospital to control viral dispersion or whether it's how do I manage the carbon reporting through these different areas. Or another one is industrial automation using 5G so that I can be through my VR set I can actually manipulate the cobot remotely. It's it's incredible, and these are all examples of the uh, of the use cases we have on our website. That's the magic thing about new technologies, right? Because if we do not have 5G, for example, now we can't plan this <laughs> to to work all over the world. So it's it's really amazing, man. When we when we are inserted in this world. It's how and how the things are going fast. So, mm -hmm. well, think <laughs> it, about a virtual factory. Yeah. I mean, now you're getting into the stages of the industrial yeah. metaverse. Yeah, where we actually have folks that are delivering a digital twin to work in the end customer's virtual factory to ensure all the alignment, yeah. all the rest of the sequencing, everything is there, and then from that they'll go and build it. It's it's pretty incredible. Yeah. It is, for sure. If someone that is looking for us or hear, on a, hear us on mm. the podcast wants to start right now, I want to start where I should point to. So I think that, again, the resources we have, we have webinars, we have white papers. Great. We have a toolkit that talks about this, how do I compose a digital twin? Mm -hmm. What does that framework look like? How do I start? That's a great place to do it. Um, you can reach out to uh, Digital Twin Consortium, info at digitaltwinconsortium.org. Certainly uh, from there, we get a lot of members also on LinkedIn. Perfect. So there's a whole series of things that we have because what we're about, what this consortium is about, is not just cutting through the hype and the awareness mm -hmm. of Digital Twin, but it's accelerating the adoption. And that's through best practices with the industry leaders, the most experienced, that have the expertise in developing, in simulating modeling, in deploying, operating, maintaining, and even the decommissioning. Great. Thank you very much for your time. Likewise, this is, uh, this is great to be able to uh, reach your audience, and uh, I hope that uh, any questions, whatever, please. Good. Thank you very much, happy. my friend. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you.